The only antidote to fear is courage. So when that, when that scary thought comes into your head, you just have to have the courage to accept that and deal with it. So if you're out of body and you suddenly get this idea about, gee, I've been out here a long time or well, how much time you kind of lost track of time and, um, you know, and you have this idea, maybe you can't get back. Just have to have the courage to say, that's okay. Wow. What are they talking about, Thomas? Okay. Flat Earth? What the bleep? I mean, I, the Earth is round. I, you know, I see my uh, globe at Earth every day. And but is it? I mean, maybe it's not. I mean, sure, it has me questioning things now. Uh, so uh, what? I mean, who needs sci-fi, right, guys? Who needs sci-fi? We're living it. We are living in sci-fi. I mean, uh, it's just not to mention that. Not much mention today. We're going to be also discussing uh, out-of-the-body experiences. This is going to be a crazy show today. But the great part about it, we have a professional expert out there uh, who happens to be a uh, past NASA nuclear physicist, Tom Campbell's with us today to straighten us out and tell us exactly what's really going on. So, yeah. <laughs> Um, no, 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 no. I'll, I'll tell you when we'll play it. We'll play that one later. Let, let's see. Let's get a picture of Tom up on the screen there. There you go. Um, so I, what a, what a great show. On the first half of the show, we're going to have, we're going to be talking about out-of-body experiences. And the second half, we're getting into the flat earth theory. Can you imagine that? Can you hear what they, that guy just, that person just said on the screen? That's just amazing to me. So, uh, before we get too started, before we get started too quickly here, let me uh, tell you all to check us out on Facebook Live now if you want to see us in person or you can continue listening on Blog Talk. We're, uh, we're reaching all around the world now on Blog Talk as well. Uh, also, we'll be putting this uh, show up on YouTube in addition to that. So uh, not, we're not doing Periscope today, but we will be doing that on a more regular basis in the future. Uh, the second thing I want to mention too before we get started with uh, uh, Tom Campbell here is – the Wake Up Hour, Luke. We got the Wake Up Hour, the new show called The Wake Up Hour. Yep, with Start, the the, yeah, with well, the, the That's the manifesting hour. Oh, the manifesting yeah. hour, yeah. But The Wake Up Hour, we're actually starting that in February. Yeah, and we, have, it's be, it's, we have a good lineup for that, too. So oh, yeah. Our, for, yeah, our first our first guest is going to be Kevin Shipp. He's a, um, he's a uh, re retired CIA uh, agent. You got to get and, these people to wake up, I, you know? Well, he's going to be talking about the shadow <laughs> government. What's, what's going on with the shadow? You know, there's a shadow IRS part of the shadow government no I yeah didn't know there's that. like there's like your irs that you know everyone hates to begin with right. then they have this like evil irs i mean <laughs> i thought irs is evil enough you know what's yeah. going on with that you know <laughs> how can you be more evil than that right <laughs> but uh and we're getting into our how our constitutional rights are being eroded every day it's gonna be a great show coming up it's funny because someone actually uh was telling me about this uh the, the, shadow how the, no, how the earth was flat. Someone was telling me how well, they. Well, thought, yeah, yeah. We, we, we're yeah. getting to that. Well, you yeah. know, listen, so if anybody's going to be able to straighten us out today, it's going to be Tom Campbell <laughs> because, you know, not only. Uh, now, Tom, do you have any uh, NAS, do you have any NASA contracts that you can't say? Because one thing Kevin Ship tells us is everyone has to sign these non disclosure forms that if you say anything, you'll be put in jail. <laughs> oh, wow. are, you, are you still obligated? No, I don't have anything like that at all. Um, good, good. I. I um, the la I'm retired now. The last I worked for NASA was, I don't know, seven, eight years ago, right. something like that. So uh, I've got no um, strings attached. Nice. I'll tell you just exactly what I think. <laughs> you can't get any better than that. Uh, the last thing I want to say, too, before I do a, a formal introduction of Tom is – Donate, guys. Donate a dollar. Go to our site. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization, 501C. We're here really just to raise the frequency. Our, our really goal is to help you learn how to dial dial to that radio station of love and raise the frequency and the vibration because I'll tell you what, no matter how horrible things are going on in the world, you know, what, whatever illusion or, or um, delusion you may believe of what's happening, it can be shifted, changed, per perceived by our intentions and by our perception. And uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll talk more about that. But get online. Get on board with us. Go to how, to how to Help. You could go to Reoccurring Donation. If you want to donate a dollar a month, that's great. Uh, if you want to donate more, whatever the case may be, we're here for you. We have our UI education program. We're getting into schools and working on our platform of showing kids at a young age from first grade to 12th how their thoughts create their reality. That's our Imagine If program up here. And uh, so we're really excited about getting, the, getting this movement moving. If you want to buy some shirts, go online you can check out our shirts as well so uh get involved get involved in the movement whether you want to whatever your your talents treasures and your in your time is you want to put into that go ahead so without further ado tom let's get into the good stuff here all right i am so excited about having you back um uh you, let's, you have a little applause button let's let's have to do a little applause for tom you know welcome back tom 
<laughs> well, I guess Luke, Luke will have to get the applause going here a little bit. Uh, <laughs> so Tom Campbell is a nuclear physicist, began uh, research altered states of consciousness with Bob Monroe, Journeys Out of the Body, uh, Far Journeys, and the Ultimate Journey at Monroe Laboratories in the Earth, 1970. Luke, boy, your timing's great, man. <laughs> you played it for me. <laughs> Sorry, I had the ad ready. <laughs> but um, the Monroe Laboratory for the Study of Conscious and Up and Running. These are early drug-free consciousness pioneers. I guess you have to say that because back in the 70s, Tim Leary and the gang were uh, going the other direction, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, uh, drug-free consciousness conscious pioneers helped design experiments, develop technology for creating specific altered states where the main subject of study – guinea pigs, let's say, all, all are at the same time. Tom is the TC physicist described in Bob Maroon's uh, second book, Far Journeys. Campbell has been a series of explorer of frontiers of reality, mind, consciousness, and the psychic phenomenon for the last 40 years. I'm telling you what, and he is all over, he's all over YouTube. You'll see him everywhere. Google, he's, you'll, we'll, we'll get to how you can reach him if you want. Um, Using his acquired mastery of the out-of-body experience and as a research tool, and that's what they did at the Monroe Institute. They showed you kind of scientifically how you can have an OBE, an out-of-body experience. Uh, inner workings and casual dynamics of a larger system. The result of research unites the worlds of objective and subjective experience under one scientific explanation, thus arriving the goal of generating one unified comprehensive theory of everything. And that's his latest book. It's called My Big Toe. The theory of toe being the theory of everything uh, that bridges metaphysics and physics with one scientific understanding. So welcome back, Tom. So looking forward to our discussion today. So much to talk about in a short period of time. Yes. <laughs> short period of time. <laughs> um, so uh, people are, you know, people are tired of the routines, getting up to go to work, eating this, saying that. Uh, watching TV, going home, going to bed. I mean, we have this just general routine, this repeti repeti rep rep repetition in our life that uh, people just want to have uh, some new experience that would not be that with no side effects, like I said, drug free. And to me, it seems like what what more can you ask for of a new experience and having an out of body experience? I mean, that to me seems like I, I would never, if I was able to do it all the time, I'd probably stay asleep all the time or at least in my bedroom and continue doing that. Uh, so let's let's jump right into that. Uh, what 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 what's the experience like? The OBE. Okay. Well, first we have to understand a little bit about about what it is. You know, um, when you have a an out of body experience, it's much like any other experience in that you see, hear, uh, also you can feel, smell. You know, all of those all of those things. All your senses are engaged, uh, but they're not engaged here in this. A reality frame that we call our physical universe. They're engaged elsewhere. Now, all that's really being done here is that you are shifting, using your intent, you're, you are shifting to a different data stream. <clears throat> and I guess I'll have to explain that a little bit. We live in a virtual reality. This physical universe of ours is a computed reality. Science is getting to that point now. It's, that's kind of the big thing going on in science, and awful lot of physicists these days think that is the answer because that's the only thing that will um, explain the results of the experiments that they do. So this virtual reality thing has got to be mainstream uh, these days, which is good. That's real good progress. So what that means is our reality is computed. If it's Computed, that means we are consciousness receiving a data stream. And out of body is just to shift to a different data stream. It's sort of like uh, being in the world of Warcraft, and then you uh, shift over to uh, The Sims or to uh, No Man's Sky or some other virtual reality. It's just a different data stream, right? You're still the same consciousness. You're the same player, but you can just pick up on a different data stream or a different program. Well, that's kind of the way this out-of-body is. Now, the second thing to understand about an out-of-body is that in that reality frame, it's not as buttoned down as it is here. Here in this what we call our physical universe, this virtual reality has a very tight rule set, which means it, it uh, determines, the rules determine energy exchanges here. So they determine everything that we do and everything we can't do. We can't jump 20 feet in the air. 
Well, there's a reason for that. The rule set doesn't allow it. You see, we don't have the strength. We weigh too much. Our bones are too heavy, et cetera, et cetera. That's all by the rules of our biology. We just can't do that. So the rule set, just like it does in World of Warcraft, your elf only has so many spells, so many hit points, you know, uh, falls off. You know, if he stays underwater too long, he drowns. You see, that's that's the rule set in World of Warcraft. Sims has its own rule set. Every virtual reality has a rule set. Well, in the rule sets that seem physical like this one, they're very tight rule sets. Everything is tightly managed, if you will, by the rules. When you go into an out-of-body state, now you're in a different virtual reality. You're getting a different data stream. It's a different virtual reality. And in that virtual reality, the rule set is very small. It's very uh, lax, if you say. There's not a lot of rules on what can happen. So, 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 so laying yeah. down, laying down in your bed, and you're, um, and not not all the time, like not all the time, you could be conscious of your out of body experience. You could be unconscious of it. So you don't have to believe in these or understand these parameters, as you're saying, to still have an out of body experience. No, those parameters are neither here nor there. I'm just trying to make the whole idea of it seem rational to the people who are who are listening here. But that's not important that you that you know all that. It does take a little practice to get to the point where you can let go of this reality and embrace a different data stream. Now, that's that's actually more a thing of unlearning than it is a thing of learning. It's not that you have to learn something new, some new technique. You have to let go of all the things that you've been doing. You have to let go of this reality. You ha- your mind has to not be noisy you know, most of us, we have thoughts jumping around in our head going 10 different directions all the time. That's just the way we are. Well, that doesn't work if you are wanting to let go of this reality. So you need to quiet that mind. Usually people do that with meditation. That's why it's associated with sleep, because at sleep, you basically do let go of this reality. So that's kind of the sleep out of body connection. It's not necessary at all. You can be in multiple realities and be perfectly wide awake in both of them. It's not necessary that it's a thing that's associated with, you know, with going to sleep. In fact, the out of body, you never do lose consciousness. You go from consciousness in this reality frame to consciousness in another reality frame. If you lose consciousness first, it's called a lucid dream. Then you lose consciousness, then you wake up in another reality frame, if you will, in the dream reality frame. So, my point is that what, what is it like? What's the experience? Well, it, because this this uh, reality that you're going to be in, this out of body reality, is a very has a very loose rule set. What you experience has a lot to do with what you bring to it. You see, in this physical reality, we have a we have a an arrangement here for feedback that says. What we put our intent on, if we have a focused intent, that focused intent can modify future probability, you see. But it takes a while to do that. It's not instant. You don't say, oh, my intent's this, and then poof, there it is. It doesn't work like that. It takes a long time because of this rule set. When you're in out-of-body, it's very quick. So if you get into the out-of-body state and you're frightened, you have fear about something might get you there because it's the unknown, and we tend to be afraid of the unknown, then what you'll probably find is something scary. And something probably will get you there because you'll manifest that because that's what's in your mind, you see. So much of what you're going to see in this in this out of body state will have to do with what you bring to it, your fears. So the first thing, if you don't want to be constantly meddling in your own game here, you know, creating things there that then you have to deal with, you have to get rid of the fear. You have to get rid of all expectations. If you've been reading books and they say, here's what out of body was, you know, here's my experience. And you think, well, that's the way it has to be. Then that's the experience you'll have. You'll be trying to have somebody else's experience because you have an expectation that that's the way it is. So the out of body world is not like the physical world. You know, everybody that goes to Chicago sees pretty much the same stuff. You go to the planetarium, you go to see the tall buildings, you go see the lake, and everybody that goes there will all see those same things. In the outer body, it's not like that because, one, you're getting data that you have to interpret. 
And everybody interprets that data in their own way, according to their own fears, their own, you know, cares, their own experience. So we're all going to interpret it differently, even if we got exactly the same data stream. It's not going to seem like the same place. Here in this physical reality with a real tight rule set, everybody gets basically the same sort of thing. There's not a lot of room for interpretation. You can't look at a building and say, well, I think that's a short building. And somebody else says, no, it's a tall building. We all kind of agree that, you know, it's a tall building or a short building because that's what happens when you have a very tight rule set. Everything is well defined by the rules. Well, in this, in this larger consciousness system that you can explore, which is really what you're exploring when you go out of body, the rule set's not so tight. What you think has a lot to do with what you're going to see. Your history, your beliefs, all will have a lot to do with what, you, with what you're going to experience. And it's not just that there's a fixed thing there, but the system itself may take an opportunity while you're out to send you certain kinds of imagery, cert add certain things to your data stream that it thinks might be helpful for you to help you grow up or to help you understand better what you're doing. You may... Um, because, because if you have fear, you'll find a fearful experience. And if you find a fearful experience, that leaves you with more fear. Fear's the problem here. You know, fear is the problem in our whole reality. We want to get less fear. So often, a, a new person to the outer body will be giving a fear test, which is basically to see, do you have a low enough level of fear to be able to do this without scaring yourself so much that you're worse off at the end of it than you would if you'd never done it at all. So who's, so, test, who's testing you, Tom? Is it your higher self? Is it uh, God got us all there is? Uh, is it, I mean, is it somebody, because I, I agree with you that we're here to grow and to raise our vibration and frequency and to go from this, and it's not higher or lower, but just from a channel of fear frequency to a love frequency, right? Right. So who's testing, in your opinion, who do you think is testing us? Well, the, the testing going on, I just say that that is the larger consciousness system. You see, our growing up, as we, as we get rid of our fear and become love, then we're part of the system. We're consciousness. The system is a consciousness system. We're part of that system. So as we grow up, the system gets that advantage as well because we're a part of it. So we lower our entropy, it lowers its entropy, because we're a piece of it, it's, it's us, we're it. So that's the system, wants us to succeed. It would like us to grow up. So it has an incentive to uh, you know, give us some information, put things in our data stream that helps us do that. Think about uh, you know, your World of Warcraft. If the World of Warcraft wants you to uh, figure out how to level up, it will give you things in that game that helps you understand the game, helps make you a better player. It'll lead you through, you know, uh, challenges that aren't too hard in the beginning so that you can have some successes. You see, the game, the system, the game, the server, if you will, is going to try to help you succeed in the system because by you succeeding, that's how they make money. You're going to keep sending them, you know, dollars per month to play the game. If you get there and fail every time you try, you give up and go away. So this system's like that, too. It's the consciousness system. It wants you to grow up and become love. So it's, it programs the system such that it, you know, helps you do that. And that collective consciousness or that collectiveness or whatever you want to choose to call it, the, all there is, the source, or, is within, built within the system or uh, could be out, outside of the system. Yeah, that is the system. That that's, is the the whole, system. that's the whole system. So this, what I call the larger consciousness system, that's it. That's our total and complete. That's, that's the source. Gotcha. So that's, would, you, would your thoughts and intentions be more like the joystick or the controller that you're, you're manipulating? Exactly. Your thought, your intention is the, is the motive force. It's what changes things. So with your intent, that's how you get in this reality in the first place. You have to let go of the physical reality. In other words, you let go of one data stream. As long as you embrace that data stream, well, then that's it. That's what you're going to get. That's the data. So first thing, you have to let that go. Then you have to have an intent as to what it is you'd like to accomplish. What's your point here? What is it you're trying to learn? Do you just want an experience? you just want to see what it's like or what? And if you have that intention, 
then that intention is yes, like, uh, you know, working the joystick or working the, you know, the keyboard or the mouse or whatever. That's what makes things happen. Right. So, okay. So uh, we all get that, let's say for right now, uh, from, and if you don't, you can always listen, listen to it again, but that's a great analogy, uh, example of what, how you can understand these different phases um, and different states of being. Uh, so we're laying in bed. We're, uh, Going through the process, which you taught and many of us taught, and you could go pick up books, whatever the case may be, um, and we're relaxing and we have the intention that we want to have a positive experience, just say for the experience of it, more so than I want to be able to head over to my neighbor's house and see what's going on over there, you know, or scare someone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so uh, just real quick, you could go in with malintentions too. You can't just you, – you, yes. you right, okay. So people right. – they call that remote viewing. Some people do remote viewing, not so much malintentions, but remote viewing. Yeah, you can remote view. Yeah. So you're laying down and you want to have that experience. Um, what's the process of what's happened? You actually physically feel yourself leaving your body? What, what, describe now, we're in the game. What's the physical experience we're getting? Okay. To? okay. Now that physical experience will change with time. In the beginning, because you don't know what to expect, you kind of create things that show you or they give you signs, if you will, that gives you ind indicators that something's happening, that you're just not lying in bed. You need these indicators, otherwise you, find, you feel that you're just lying in bed, nothing's happening at all, you won't notice. So because you need indicators as a beginner, you'll get indicators. One of the things you may start to get is you may feel your body starting to vibrate. It's almost like you're, uh, you know, a, a flag, you know, in the wind. It's kind of shaking and vibrating. You may hear buzzes. Sometimes people feel electrical shocks. Often people will find themselves in what they call sleep paralysis. That is, they can't move. They're lying there, and now their mind's awake, but they can't move anything. They feel like they're paralyzed, and that usually is followed by panic, which is, you know, followed by lots of fear, and then they somehow burst awake, and now they're afraid to do that again. But all of these things are just indicators to let you know, well, when you let go of the data stream for the physical reality, then you're not going to be operating your physical body anymore. You've let that go. So that's all the sleep paralysis is, is that you're letting go of that reality, and as you do, you know, you're letting go of the body as well. But that frightens people because they, you know, that's a new sensation. So it takes people a long time to kind of work their way through all these sensations. And that can be part of your fear test in the sense that let's say you get this vibration state and the vibrations start to get violent. You say, well, does that start to worry you? Do you start to get up, you know, worry? Oh, what's going on here? Am I going to be ripped to shreds or what? And now you're in a, you know, back to panic, back to fear, and then the whole thing's gone. Well, the way to handle that is just flow with it. Let it go. Let it be whatever it is. You know, it's like you're on the, you're on the, the horse that's never been broken before and you're going to have to ride it till it settles down. You know, have that idea. So you just relax and go with it. And then what happens is the system sees you're not frightened. Okay. Let's go to the next step. And then the, then the vibrations will settle down and they tend to go away. Well, I say this is all happening in the beginning. Afterwards, after you kind of master this, it's not all that hard. You don't have to lie down. You don't even have to close your eyes. You don't have to go through any of this. There is no pulsations. There is none of that stuff. All you do is shift your data stream, and you're there. And you can be 50% in this reality and 50% in that reality. So I can be talking to you here on Skype like this and also be – someplace else, doing something else at the same time. See, it's easy. You can, you know, if you had two uh, monitors and two processors, you could switch back and forth between, you know, The Sims and, and World of Warcraft if you wanted to, right? It wouldn't really be a big deal. You could have them both up on the screen at the same time, and you could really be playing both of them. It's not that big a deal to do that. So it's just a zero-sum game. If you had 10 different virtual realities up there, you couldn't be in any of them completely. You'd be sharing your awareness across all 10. So that's the, that's the difference. So in the beginning, it's a big deal. Afterwards, it's no deal at all. 
it seems like it's much more efficient than using Skype and other um, other modes of communication. <laughs> you know, if you're if you're using the out-of-body experience. But I would say that probably the number one fear, uh, I would for beginners, probably perhaps doing OBE uh, out-of-body experiences, would be that it's um, and maybe you could speak to this. That what happens if I get this out of body experience? So I'm out there in the in the in the game in the matrix, and uh, and I can't get back. The fear of getting stuck there and never coming back. Yeah, that that won't happen. That's not going to happen. Uh, no, no, nobody's out there right now trying to get back in. Right? <laughs> no, that doesn't happen. You are centered here in this avatar. Your consciousness. You're playing an avatar called your physical body. Okay, that's like your elf. You know. I, that's the avatar you're playing. Now, you are a, you are using from that avatar. That's your that's your launching platform. Your consciousness is tied to that avatar. Now, that avatar, let's say, lies down and and uh, goes into a a larger reality frame. Okay, but it's doing that from that avatar, and you're tied to that avatar. So when it all, you know, when it all uh, ends up. At the end, you and that avatar are connected. That's how your consciousness is projecting through that avatar. So you'll always come back to that avatar. It's just not a problem. You'll wake up the next morning and you'll be there lying in bed in that body. Going to uh, work. You'll be going to work again, don't yeah, worry. Yeah, you'll get up and have to go to work every day. So that's not a thing. Mostly the fear that you're talking about is the fear of the unknown. Yeah. You see, because it's, you know, it's like you're going to a place you've never been. Is it scary? Are there monsters there? Is there something that's going to get me? Will I not be able to get back? And you have all of this fear. And what happens when you have that fear? You manifest those things happening. So if you have that fear, then you're going to get out there and you're going to think, oh, my God, how do I get back? You see, and now that will become a fear. And then in seconds, you'll find yourself back in a cold sweat and terrified uh, about, you know, going out of body because it's so scary you almost didn't get back, you know, is the way you'll think about it. But, well, it sounds like you manifest things much quicker, too, in that, in that yes, state. Yes, so very we, quickly. You think it, you experience it. So if I go in out there and I'm really not clear on my mental uh, uh, intentions and beliefs on what I'm experiencing, all of a sudden I think of two giant reptilian uh, beings coming at me, I'm going to experience that at that moment and – and I'll and I'll go through the emotional uh, ex experience, right? Yes, exactly. That's that's the way it is. So if if you really want to explore it, first you have to get your own consciousness un under control, so that it's not constantly, you know, having those kinds of uh, those thoughts that create those sorts of things. Otherwise, you'll never know whether you it's what what you're seeing is what you're creating, or something outside of what you're creating. So first step, you have to get your own mind under control to where you can just let all that go. That's why we always start with meditation, because that's a practice of getting your mind under control, of emptying out that mind so there are no thoughts there. Well, when there are no thoughts there, now what you see and do is, you know, outside of you rather than being created by you. So that's why meditation is a is usually a first step. And if you don't do that on the first step, then you're experiences tend to be a little wild and crazy because your your consciousness is a little wild and crazy. Sure. Let me ask you a trick question here, a uh, tricky question, I should say, not a trick question. So if our imagination and our thoughts and intentions creating is, are, is creating this experience when in, in the out-of-the-body experience, mm -hmm. how do you distinguish between or is there a distinction between an actual uh, – other entity, let's say an alien, a real life mm -hmm. alien versus the manifestation that you're creating with your own imagination. Okay. There is, there is no uh, tag that comes with the data. In other words, there's several sources of data. There's a source of data that's just outside of you. That's the source of the data stream. Okay. That, there's, there's that source. But you can also create data. That's your imagination. And when you create that data, you get that data just you know, becomes part of your, your data stream. There's no flag on it that says this is data you created and this is data that's different, you know, and one of them's in the red range and the other's in the blue range or something. It's not like that. Data's data. You get it all. And the only way that you can separate it is with experience. You have to have experience. 
first you have to learn to quiet your mind. Then you can actually get other data besides just your mind flying around all the time. Otherwise, nothing's coherent if you don't quiet your mind first. Then you have to go to, let's say you have an experience and you talk to some non-physical being and you have a conversation. Okay, now that you've done that once, you can reconnect just by intending to reconnect to that individual. Okay, that will reconnect you to the individual. Now, if you have this conversation once, you'll have no way of knowing whether that's real or whether you're making it up. But if you have this conversation 20 times, going over all sorts of things, you very quickly will know whether this is the same kind of stuff that's in your head or whether it's stuff that you'd never thought of before and is completely outside of your head. But the real, the real question here isn't, is it real? The question is, is it useful? Does this help me grow up? Is this significant? Because, yes, you may be talking to yourself and it may be significant. Or you may be talking to yourself and it may just be garbage, you know, just yeah, three-headed monsters or something. So the point is, is it significant? That's the real key. Are you growing up from it? Is it? Are you learning something? After a while, you'll know whether this is outside or inside. But it takes some time. So the biggest mistake most people make is that the first time they run into something, they start to question it and judge it. Is this real? Did I make this up inside of me, outside of me? What's going on here? But they don't have enough information to make that judgment intelligently. So they they have just the teeniest little bit of data, and now they want to make a judgment about it. Can't do it. Work with it. Work with it. And after you've had that, like I say, after you've interacted with that being lots of times, you'll know. You see, it's just like anybody you meet on the street. If you met somebody on the street at a bus stop and every Friday you get on a bus at that place, you kind of meet this person, you talk to them, you know, the first minute that you spend with them, you really don't know anything about them. You have no idea. But if you talk to them like that every Friday, you know, for a year, you'll know something about them. You'll have a sense of them. You'll know, are they real? Are they nuts? You know, do they have, you know, good thoughts? Are they good people? Are they bad people? You know, you'll have a, a whole better idea about them. Then you can make a judgment as to, you know, the value and the worth and the reality of that individual, but not on the first 30 seconds that you, you know, exchange information with them. You can't judge them. You don't know. So it's the same way. You just have to spend time there doing things, repeating things to the point that you do eventually know where the source is and is this outside of you. You know when you get things that are just not in there. You get ideas that surprise you. You get things that just don't make sense. Uh, You just get things you know are not you. Besides, it's valuable. It's giving you information that's not information that you've ever thought about. And eventually, you get the sense of who they are, what they are, and uh, whether or not it might be your imagination or not. But no, there's no guarantee what it is. And you can get mixtures. You can be getting part of something from outside of you and making up stuff about it at the same time. (laughs) That's why it's important to get your own mind under control first. Otherwise, you never know really what's going on. Wow, that that's fascinating. In fact, it's that's so fascinating. It's mind blowing that, it you know, it's, it's hard enough to go through our reality here and to find out what's true, what's not true, just by the media or whatever else. It, now you're looking at a whole other uh, dimension or experience where you got to distinguish between, like you said, what's outside, what's inside. When you're outside, is there inside going on? And uh, when you're outside. It's it's fascinating. It is so intellectually stimulating. I just find it find it amazing that yeah. you could have that experience. Yeah. Two- there's there's one other there's one other thing too that makes it even more complicated. Here we have a very buttoned down reality, right? It's a very tight rule set. Well, things happen. You know, things are very consistent here because of that rule set. When you're not in that kind of a tight rule set, your ability to interpret the data is dependent on your experience there. You see, well, that's sort of like that here. I mean, but if we go to New York and then we go to Chicago and then we go to L.A., you know, they're all similar. You know, they're all big cities. They're all full of people. They all have, you know, big buildings, that kind of thing. They're all pretty similar. 
So we get to the sense of what a big city's like or what a small town's like. So we can kind of very quickly come up on experiences and sort them into buckets of things that we're familiar with. When you go to an out-of-body reality where the rule set's very loose, you don't have that. Now you have to interpret the data, but it's not like anything you've experienced before. You see, it's sort of like seeing a big city for the very first time. You don't know what to make of it. There's You're no overwhelmed by it. There's yeah, no you don't know you don't know how to get around in it. It's just totally mystifying. After you've lived there, it's not like that. So that's another thing you have. You don't have experience there. It's very hard for you to interpret what that data means. But after you've been there, after you've lived there enough times, now you can kind of understand how it works and get the lay of it. So it takes experience, which takes time, and it takes mental clarity, and that's not quick. That's why most people have a real hard time with it, because it takes a lot of time to work all this stuff out. It's practice and experience is what you, with anything yeah. in life, honestly, even even out, out of life, it's out of body experience. <laughs> it's the same thing. I have two questions for you real quick before we do a quick break. We're going to, look, we're going to do the short break, okay? But if we have two questions. Then I want to talk a little bit about at the rest of the show, a little bit about the flat earth. Um, say you're caught up. You're in the out of body experience. You've been meditating. You kind of got past some of the preliminary fears. And you're experiencing that you what you want to experience, and all of a sudden a negative or a scary thought creeps into your head, and you mm-hmm. and you don't want to lose it where you, you you come back snap back into your body again. But what are some suggestions that you'd give somebody to be able to to redirect themselves and get refocused into whatever their experience is at the moment? Well, the the only antidote for fear, and that's what that scary thought that comes into your head has is, comes from a fear. The only antidote to fear is courage. So when that when that scary thought comes into your head, you just have to have the courage to accept that and deal with it. So if you're out of body and you suddenly get this idea about, gee, I've been out here a long time or well, how much time you kind of lost track of time and, um, you know, and you have this idea, maybe you can't get back, just have to have the courage to say, that's OK. Everything will happen however it happens. And I'm all right with that. You see, you need that attitude. So if you say, wow, I'm out here all by myself, you know, if some big monsters came around, you know, I'd be easy pickings. You have to say, well, that's okay. I'll deal with the stuff as I deal with it. So the antidote for fear is courage. You just let it go, accept it. And, you know, you have to have that feeling, you know, in the beginning, when you get that fear of maybe I can't come back, maybe this will be the end of me. Maybe I'll die. People will come in in the morning and my dead body will be lying there in the bed. You have to say, that's okay. I'm going to do this. I want to do it. And if that happens, that happens. If that doesn't happen, it doesn't. But I accept that and I'm going on. If you don't have courage, then you're always going to have fear. So it takes courage. You have to be able to just accept that if stuff happens, you'll deal with it. And you'll deal with it the best you can and the chips will fall wherever they do. And that's okay. No, I, I think that's uh, that's great advice because you have to go through it, you have to deal with it, and then you can shift your intentions, perhaps to go through it, that process as you're whatever's sure. happening. So, uh, one last question here for you: Do, Since you've been doing this for so long, and got, you're one of the, your uh, founders with Monroe, uh, you know, actually uh, monitoring scientifically, ma- measuring this, and everything, do you find yourself doing more, having more OBEs, and consciously doing that, or less now as you get older and more engaged in this reality, or you're, are you more engaged in the OBE reality? Um, what I have found, what I have found, is that it's not a one or other. It's not like you're in this reality or in that reality, and how much time do you spend in either one? I live now all the time in a larger reality that contains them both, okay, in a larger reality that contains multiple reality frames. And it's not that I have to leave here to go there and leave there to come here. I can parallel process. So basically, you live in a larger reality. The bigger the reality you live in, the more choices you have. And it's not a – I don't know. It's a little hard for me to describe this, but it's it's, – well, again, maybe it's like having, uh, you know, the two sports games on a big monitor, you know, the picture in a picture. You know, you have two of those on the, at the same time. Well, you're watching both games. You're in both of those games, parallel processing them, and it's not that hard to do. 
So you can live in a larger reality where you no longer really have to meditate. You know, you don't have to sit down and say a mantra. You don't have to, uh, you know, lie down to to uh, get out of this reality frame. It's a matter of just picking up data streams. You've been there enough. You have enough experience. Your intent knows a lot of places to go, people to meet, things to do already. So it's not a matter of having to go out and search it out and explore it. You just do it, connect to it, get the data you need. And eventually it's not even, um, like most things, it's, it's not even a matter of your intellect saying, oh, now I want to do this or now I want to do that. You just live in this larger space and you just interact with it kind of naturally all the time. So it's not a, it's not really an intellectual choice so much anymore as it is you just live in a bigger space. So somebody walks up and says, hello, I'm Joe Smith. How are you today? Well, you shake his hand and you talk with Joe. But at the same time, you're maybe getting all sorts of other information about Joe or about other things, about connections. Just all that stuff fills in all at the same time without you really having to think about it. So you're, you're, you're graduating from looking at life or experiencing life from a black and white perspective, but more so from a gray perspective. You're filling in a lot of the, the, the details of. Yeah, and, and from a color perspective. Yeah. Yeah, and a dimensional perspective. So it's just living in a larger reality is where you go eventually with it because it's not that hard anymore. It's a simple thing, and it all blends together into just a bigger space to live in. Fascinating, fascinating. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back um, with Tom Campbell, author of My Big Toe, we're going to get into the flat earth and Tom's, Tom's thoughts on that. We'll be right back. All right, we are back with Tom Campbell, uh, author of My Big Toe. If you want to reach him, you could go to – he's all over the YouTube. Google him. Uh, YouTube channel is uh, www, YouTube channel course, then slash TWCJR. Uh, four four, or just uh, type in job, uh, Tom Campbell and go to his YouTube. Make sure you subscribe to him. He has thousands and thousands of uh, subscribers, and click the bell so you get his uh, his feedback. He has just fascinating information out there. Um, or go pick up his. his uh, I think we're putting his uh, book up on our on our Amazon site on our actual website too. You can pick his book up there as well. So Tom, uh, wow! I and mean, in the first part of the show, we we mentioned a little bit the flat Earth. Um, why is it, in your opinion, do you think that? This it's 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 like a phenomenon in many ways. I mean, you got these flat ear, flat Earth uh, believers. I don't know what the right term it is for these people. They're coming up and really truly believing that the Earth perhaps is not a globe, but it's actually flat, and perhaps maybe it's not revolving or rotating around uh, the stars and things like that and the sun, but maybe that's rotating around the Earth. It's just it's, it's such a concept that most and i'm a very open-minded person i've learned this time point in my life to be open-minded and uh walk lightly because <laughs> things are just not what you think they are out there but what, what's your what's your take on that and um perhaps maybe how you could relate that to the virtual reality aspect of it okay uh well first your your idea of, of walk lightly and uh, you know not just throw anything uh just because it disagrees with the way you think about things that's a real good idea that's what I call open-minded skepticism. You have to always stay open-minded and always be skeptical of everything. Okay, we have this uh, we have this flat Earth uh, idea that's just grown now in the last you know I don't know three or four years from uh, uh, something very minor. You know, actually something that of course was a joke. You know, you refer to the you know the flat Earth Society when you're trying to make a joke about you know a bunch of people who uh, you know don't know what they're talking about or have gone off on some kind of tangent, right? It kind of was a joke for a long time, but then it's gotten more and more serious, and you have more and more people uh, that are talking about it seriously. Well, if we if we actually look at what you know the Earth is. We can talk about actually what the whole universe is, the whole physical universe. It's ones and zeros. <laughs> it's data on a hard drive. Okay, now data on a hard drive is not dimensional at all. When you are in a, when what's being computed in a computer really doesn't have any dimensions, right? In a computer, I can write an equation for a sphere, and up comes a bunch of data that uh, defines the surface of a sphere. Okay, well. That's just in a computer. We won't say that that's spherical. It's just data that represents a sphere. <clears throat> I can write data that represents a flat plane, you know, equations, a plane, and then all the points will lie on this flat plane. 
Well, that's not really a plane. It's just data in a computer. So data in a computer is non-dimensional. There really is no dimensions to a virtual reality. So this whole universe is a physical, you know, virtual. It seems physical. Tight rule set. Seems physical. Physical universe is a virtual reality. It's a bunch of ones and zeros, you know, in a processor someplace. It has no dimension. But it does have a rule set. And the rule set defines how things work here. Things can't happen here if they don't obey, you know, the only things happen here that obey the rule set. All right. Now, the rule set here appears to be that we live in a three-dimensional reality. Okay. Three dimensions. Yeah. Now, in a three-dimensional reality, you have three-dimensional shapes. You can also have two-dimensional things. You can have flat planes in a three-dimensional reality, and you can have lines, you know, which are one-dimensional. So in this three-dimensional reality, our space, three-dimensional space, is going to be full of three-dimensional objects. Three-dimensional objects are things like spheres, cubes, you know, trapezoid, you know, thing, things that take up, have volume, right? That's a three-dimensional thing. Okay. Now, the rule set is such that the way our universe works has to do with gravity. That's the fundamental thing that makes things happen. That's the, that's why the, the, um, uh, what do we call them? The galaxies are in spirals. They're in a spirals because of gravity. If it wasn't for gravity, we wouldn't expect them to be spiraling like that. That's why, you know, when, when, uh, uh, when they fire a rocket that's going to drop a, a satellite someplace that's going to allow phone calls all over the world so I can pick up my phone and talk to my friends in China, okay, that's, those satellites go up based on a spherical Earth, based on gravity, based on orbits. Orbits have to do with Probably. the attraction of gravity between the satellite and the Earth and yeah. the speeds that they're going and all that sort of stuff. When they fire a, a rocket off to visit Mars or to land on what the moon of Saturn and all that sort of thing. All of those trajectories are computed based on a 3d reality that has, uh, things coalescing into spheres. And taking, okay, account, you get a, taking account variables like gravity, they have to take gravity. In every yeah. Yeah. If you take a drop of water and you let a drop of water fall through the air, well, you get this teardrop shape. The only reason you get the teardrop shape is because the air is rushing by it, which makes it kind of, have a head and has a tail, right? You take that wind away, and what do you have with your drop of water? You'll have a sphere. It's a little spherical drop without the wind blowing on it. Why is that? It's because the molecules of water have a thing called cohesion, which means they stick together. And when in the absence of any force pushing it or pulling it, when you have a, a bunch of matter and they have it has cohesion, you end up with a sphere. A sphere is a is a uh, is a shape that just is natural in our rule set, okay? So now we'll get back to that. So, but our universe is not a sphere. Our Earth is not a sphere. None of those things actually are like that. They're calculations, but they're calculated with a with mathematics, if you will, that is 3D in nature. And by being 3D in nature, then you end up with spherical appearing. You know, a virtual Earth. That's virtually spherical, if you will, and all the planets and all the rest of the stuff being spherical because they have nothing pushing it or pulling them to give them a tail or to flatten them out or do anything else. So they just end up being in spheres. That's the natural shape of stuff. So gravity is the thing that pulls everything together. Anyway, that idea of gravity is what allows us to land a rocket on you know, on a moon someplace. Well, I think, and I think the flat, why, that the flat earthers, I don't think they believe in gravity or like Tesla said. No, well, they wouldn't. They wouldn't. But the thing is, these days we have a lot of people who are very, uh, and very rightfully so, I think, uh, very skeptical about everything. Yeah. They're particularly <laughs> skeptical about anything that any institution of authority might say. So if you have a government or, a, you know, or any other major source of power, well, anything a source of power says is bound to be a lie. 
anything that any you know uh, government says is bound to be a lie. That's if we start with that as a given, then okay, science says that we have a spherical Earth. Well, it must be a lie, you know. Otherwise, they wouldn't be saying that. You see. <laughs> so if you have that kind of a mentality to where you just don't trust these institutions, these institutions of power, and you distrust them so much that you think that everything they say has to be a hustle of some sort. Okay. Now, that's not such a bad idea in the sense we realize a lot of these institutions and governments and big corporations, they have been lying to us. Yes, of course. That's a fact. But that doesn't mean that we now go overboard to the point that everything they say and anything they've ever said, you know, is a lie. Now, we should always be skeptical. Be skeptical of everything. And there's nothing wrong at all with saying, I'm skeptical about this being round, about uh, round, you know, geometry for the, for the planets and things. Fine, you should do that. There's nothing wrong. But you also have to be open-minded. You have to look at, you know, what, what arguments there are on both sides. Right. And I've looked a little into Flat Earth. Um, not, I haven't studied it, but I've gone to their sites. I've listened to, you know, a half hour worth of their explaining why it has to be flat. And it's mostly just bad science <laughs> when they talk about these things. There was a guy talking about an airplane. Well, an airplane, you know, they, when you get in an airplane, it always seems to fly level but it never has to turn its nose down. Well, if it never turns its nose down, then it can't be flying around a round surface. You know, it must be flat underneath. Well, that's just nonsense. That's just a, a not understanding how gravity works. Physics. You see, it's, it's missing the physics. So a lot of those things, oh, you can stand someplace and you can still see Chicago, you know, 100 miles away. Well, you couldn't do that if it was round. Well, there are ways, if you have an inversion in the atmosphere, that the light will actually bend around and you can see over the curvature you know often that's what's going on when you see mirages and you see other sorts of things so there will be times when you can see around the earth so all of the things that i've you know watched and listened to them say it's basically just not understanding Science. the physics right. of what's going on what it's a it's a layman's view of of physics that isn't right yeah. One of the things I, they mentioned, and I'm curious about myself too, uh, we have about five minutes left, so uh, I'll make this quick, is most of the planets are rotating and revolving. So they're rotating, and, and I think rotating is around the sun and then revolving is moving around while it's rotating, right? Um, yeah. But the moon doesn't. We, ne we never see the dark side of the moon. Uh, maybe explain the physics behind why that doesn't uh, revolve. Well, it does. It, it goes at exactly the same frequency that the Earth does. So as we, you know, as the moon goes around us, yeah. you'd think if it would just, we would sometimes see the back and sometimes see the front and so on as it went around us. But it's turning so that it goes one revolution as it takes one revolution around us. So it takes a revolution around its own axis as it actually, you know, takes a path around us. So it so, always keeps the same side facing us. Okay. Now, remember, this is a virtual reality. Okay. Now, virtual realities can do almost anything. Virtual realities uh, are very, uh, uh, you know, there's very few constraints on what you can do in a virtual reality. So you may find all kinds of interesting things. And, and that moon might be an interesting thing. Say, well, okay. It's a perfect. It's perfectly synced with our our own uh, you know our own revolution and the moon's revolution. It's perfectly synced so that you always see the same face. Well, how does it be so perfect? You know, how is that that it can be that perfect? You think over time, over millions of years or billions of years, it'd slip a little bit, and you know, different faces would show that sort of thing. Well, maybe they have. It's just on a time scale so wide that we don't notice it. We don't notice what anybody saw of the moon, you know, what, 20,000 years ago? Right. There's no written language, no photographs, you know. There was yes. no way to pass that information on. So we don't know that there haven't been changes. But still, in a virtual reality, you can make it exact if you want to. That's amazing. You know, if you want to, you don't have to, you know, you can do pretty much whatever, whatever you want. 
that's just amazing to me how we have that ability to do that since we're able to be the creators of our virtual reality. You know, and, and real quick, I know we got, we got to get going here. Um, and I can't thank you enough for uh, Tom for coming on and kind of explaining and bringing some uh, real science and light to these topics. Uh, in fact, I, yeah, we have to get you back on again because there's so much more I have to ask you. <laughs> but um, uh, it, it, really the reality of since we're all made of energy, the reality is it may not – the both theories may be off because we're – like you said, it's the data that we're interpreting. And and if we looked at we we would look more like a matrix experience of data and numbers everywhere if we really probably tied into our true reality. But anyway, uh, you guys been listening with uh, Tim and Tom Campbell here with uh, with my author of My Big Toe. And if you want to reach him, go on YouTube definitely and check his channel out. Subscribe to him, uh, Tom. I, again, thank you so much. It's been fascinating, eye opening, and I can't wait to hear it again and watch it as well. And uh, we'll we'll see you again soon. Okay. All right. It's been fun, it's been fun being, fun being here. here. Same here. Thank you, guys. See you next week.